This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Okay, so I'm going to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting to order on the uh, it's April 23rd of 2020, 3 o'clock. And pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 18, this meeting of the, of the uh, Finance Committee is being conducted via remote participation. And um, I'm going to... Call. Uh, I just need to get um, the participant. Make sure all of the participants um, hear and can be heard, so that we can confirm um, all of the participation requirements. Um, Lynn Griesmer, here. Can you hear? And you can be heard. Uh, Kathy Shane. I'm. I'm here. Dorothy Pam. Here. Um, and. Uh, we know that Pat's not here. Bob Hegner. I'm here and can hear. Sharon Povinelli. I can I'm here and can hear. And Mary Lou Talman. I'm here and can hear. Okay. So I think that we're all set to go with today's meeting. And uh I want to uh, first of all uh, get to the agenda and put the agenda on the screen for a moment if we can. And um uh, explain what the agenda is. And uh, I think, I'm not sure that we have any participants on at this point who are not um, members of the, no, there are two attendees. So I do want to make sure, and they are people who are not on the committee. Um, there is provision within the agenda for public comment. Um, I may take it after agenda item four um, and not wait until the last two items. And I'm going to explain why I say last two in a second. But there's information on the screen telling you what you would need to do in order to participate in public comment um, at the time that we um, reach that phase. But I uh, wanted to at least skip through some of the initial discussion because it might provide information that is going to be things that are going to um, provoke public comment interest, um, though uh, public comment doesn't necessarily have to be limited to what we're going to be talking about. The other thing that I wanted to just say right at the beginning and then turn to the next item on the agenda is that um, there is one item under unanticipated business, which I will explain later. Um, at yesterday's GOL meeting, there was a request that we um, take up um, items to assist GOL in its responsibility to move forward with um, appointing the one position that has to be reappointed um, for, in, for, I believe, July 1st for a resident uh, non-voting member of the committee. Uh, Mary Lou's term was um, expired after one year, uh, or will expire after the end of one year. And uh, that is the term that would be advertised. Um, and uh, the committee, uh, for Mary Lou's information, should be contacting you to find out whether you want to be um, in the uh, pool of candidates who would be considered for appointment. Um, so I'll come back to that at that point in the meeting. Uh, the major items we want to spend time on today, however, are to uh, follow up on our last discussion about how our budget process is going to move forward and differ from the prior um, budget process that we used last year and hadn't thought we were using this year. And uh, so with that, um, We'll have uh, the screen switch over 
to the PowerPoint presentation that was presented earlier today. And I know that um, there was a uh, number of members of the committee um, who were um, participating this morning by either as members of uh, the budget coordinating group or participating as members of the public, but not everyone. So we'll try and do a briefer version of this so we don't spend as much time quite as we did this morning. And it's also contains some information that I think you as a finance committee are more familiar with. Um, but uh, I guess we should uh, go on. Paul, are you going to do the first slides? Not hearing Paul. Yeah. So yeah, I will go through it and um, um, is there a way to show the whole page uh, then or not? Anyway, so this is a presentation that we made to the budget coordinating group. Um, budget coordinating group is um, is in the charter. It require it. It's a meeting that's called by the town manager. It includes representatives from the town council, the school committee, and the library trustees, plus any other staff that are part of it. And typically, this is a group that really, and Andy will give more detail if people feel they need it, um, will um, agrees on sort of the budget category, the budget um, projections for revenue and, and guidance for the town manager in, pre in preparing the budget. Um, the things in this presentation, we talked about BCG organization, which I don't think we really have to focus on. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the budget challenge, but really focus on the FY21 budget calendar and the impact and the role of the finance committee in the calendar. Um, this is a presentation that was put together uh, by Sonia and me and with support from Brianna Sunrid, who's our communications manager. Um, one, of th one of the things that um, I emphasized this morning uh, was that we wanted, this is a challenge to, you know, we had done so much work on the previous budget. We were really ahead of schedule. Uh, the schools had, and the library had done similar things. Um, you know, Sonia had done yeoman's work uh, to build the budget. So we were really prepared to present it to the council, to the finance committee. And then this came along and basically just washed it all away. And so we're starting new. And so there's a whole new set of parameters that we have to build this budget from and it's going to be a big challenge. And so one of the things that, uh, there are two messages I wanted to deliver. One is that we are going to do this. We will be methodical about how we do it. We will make decisions when at the right time and when we have enough information. Uh, and the other is to ask the finance committee and other people for patience as we get through the process. Um, but I, and I think the one thing that we draw from is that there's a, uh, we. I feel there'll be a renewed sense of collaboration among all the um, entities. We always have really good cooperation with the library and the school at the staff level, especially, but also at the committee level. And um, people are really committed to working together and we have very high communicators on all levels. So that's really good. Um, so the next slide down. So the uh, BCG works under consensus. And that means that uh, there are no votes taken at BCG. It's basically, you know, do we agree on these things? And the three things that we presented this morning were the concept of a one month budget, which would get us through the month of July. Um, a, and, it's, and that's to distinguish between a one twelfth budget. It's really what gets you through July. It doesn't, doesn't mean it's one twelfth of a regular budget based on prior fiscal years, uh, but can be something different. Um, FY21 budget, uh, and then the schedule that we would follow. So go to the next. And so I'm not going to spend hard, this. So this is what the BCG did this morning. They designated co-chairs and typically the uh, chair of the finance committee and the chair of the select board had been the co-chairs previously. That sort of replicated this year where by acclamation, um, uh, Lynn Driesmer as president of the council and Andy Steinberg as president of the finance committee um, were designated co-chairs of the bu budget coordinating group. And we talked about the, well, we can go to the next slide. Um, this just shows the section of the charter that references the budget coordinating group. That's not really relevant for the finance committee at this point, unless Andy or 
Do you want to put anything in here, Andy? Because no, I think that the uh, finance committee is generally more aware of what the budget coordinating group is uh, there to do it, and it includes members of the library trustees and the school committee, and then senior staff from each of those entities of government, in addition to um, members of the um, council and Paul and the finance director. And uh, it's to try and help uh, reach consensus about consider um, budget issues, including calendar, uh, but it is not a policy making board. And so, um, it, what it decides then gets reported to the finance committee, which is a large part of why we did the order of the meeting today, because uh, there's action that needs to be taken out of this and um, it needs our discussion and then referral on to the council as this committee deems appropriate. Okay. Go to the next slide, Lynn. Um, so the two things that we really focused on was a one month budget and the FY21 budget. And I'll identify some of the challenges at the next slide. Um, and so you can weigh in if you feel like there's more to be added. Um, so the, and I think we, you may have looked at the third quarter. I'm not sure if the finance committee has looked at the third quarter um, report yet, Sonia. Do you want to take this slide? No, um, that's probably going to be done at the end of the next week, okay. but um, we're right on target with our third quarter um, third quarter revenues. We've collected um, 75, maybe a little bit more than 75%, depending on the different types of revenue. What The fourth quarter is going to be the quarter that's telling, and we're going to see a lot of, um, we're going to see that we're not going to be collecting much meals tax or hotel tax, if any at all. Um, our collections are probably going to be a little slower on motor vehicle during the second half of the quarter. They do get collected eventually, though. Um, mm -hmm. Some departmental revenues, licenses and permits, investment income, that's all going to be affected for the second quarter, as well as into the new fiscal year. And you want to talk about the enterprise funds? Oh, yes, thank you, Paul. The enterprise funds as well, we were, we were having a um, consumption was going down, has been for water and sewer has gone down. So we were struggling with our water and sewer funds before this happened. Now that the schools are closed, that water consumption is going to go way down. So we're going to have a challenge with the enterprise funds as well. Um, parking revenue for downtown transportation budget. Um, we're not collecting parking revenue right now, so that's obviously going to be affected. And um, solid waste is Am ambulance. Am thank you. Ambulance receipts. What would I do without you? <laughs> A lot better, probably. <laughs> Our ambulance receipts are going to be down because calls have actually dropped since the college is emptied out. So. Yeah. Challenging, very challenging. So yeah, it's sort of interesting how with the college has gone, how how low our call volume has gotten. It's, it's more than below 50%. Um, even though we have staffed up the fire department in anticipation of increased usage, we haven't really needed to use it. We're, we're fortunate that we have because it takes time to get uh, call firefighters trained to be regular firefighters. So we're really happy to have done that. Uh, water is down, as Sonia said, because our two biggest users are uh, our University of Massachusetts, obviously, and Amherst College, and they have emptied out, and they don't have their offices being operational anymore. And sewer gets affected because the um, the water is the sewer rates are based on water rates um, and water usage. We've also had some additional expenditures for PPE. Um, we again, I mentioned the, the staff. Uh, for uh, the fire department. We've had to buy technology to help people get set up. Uh, and then we've had some public health expenditures as well. And, so and one other thing I forgot, Paul, that I mentioned this morning is um, for the rest of this fiscal year, we're gonna have a deficit. Uh, how much it is depends on a, a couple of invoices due from some of the 
educational places, but um, we should have enough returned appropriations. We're spending money on PPE, but we're all, we're not spending money on our normal in, in our normal way with all our operating budget. So there'll be some offset there. So I think we'll be fine for fiscal year twenty. Yeah. Okay. You know the next slide. So we are we are highly dependent on we're not high we we have a state uh, aid constitutes a relatively large percentage of our budgets. Um, we're in, you know, 20, almost 20% 20 of our budget comes from state aid. So what happens at the state level matters a lot. So uh, we were on a, Sonia was more attentive than I was on a call t this morning uh, with, with the Division of Local Services and got some good information out of them. But basically, and you should add to this, they basically were saying, we don't know, and we don't know when we will know. Um, and we can't give you any guidance on on your budget other than to be conservative. Yeah, it really wasn't good information. It was just the same information we have is that they don't know when they'll have information or what cuts might happen. Yeah. I want to pause for a second. Dorothy, do you have a question you want to ask now? Um, about the drop in the ambulance and EMT. Um, I'm wondering if um, it somehow allows those who are good with uh, formulas to look at the formula that we have now with the educational institutions and to see whether in fact there should be a readjustment? It's a question. Do you want me to answer that? Sure. Yeah. That, that's actually was in progress before this whole COVID started. So we are looking at that. Okay, thank you. Kathy, you have your hand up. This is a uh, question. Yeah, it's it's on the same topic, but I think Sonia, you're looking at it. I saw um, you didn't mention police, but it looks like the calls for police are way down, yeah. um, based on a Hampshire Gazette story. Um, way down. So, it's a similar thing that we may have a natural, unfortunate crisis-oriented experiment on what when the universities and colleges are in. What does it do to the volume at the police level and and fire EMT? Just. It's for, it's, uh, uh, we'll see a use impact the same way we're seeing on water and sewer, but it's worth tracking as those numbers emerge. Right, um, I was concentrating on revenues. Police department don't really bring in revenues. It was more the ambulance revenue. So I didn't, I didn't intentionally leave out the police. But it is, it is kind of an interesting experiment. Although, you, you know, in the paper today, there's an article about how just hospital admissions at emergency rooms are down. And people are saying, are people not having as many heart attacks? What's going on there? And are people choosing not to go to the emergency department? So I think there's a lot of, there are other variables other than just the university being out of session that could impact that. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of information, but it may not be the complete picture. So I can give you a little bit, a little bit of background. And I'm, again, I'll race through this piece because I think half of you have already heard this. So these, this is information that the Mass Municipal Association uh, put, put together. Uh, <laughs> bless you. Um, there are no clear answers, as, as we said. Um, the um, serious recession hitting Mass, it's, it's, it's worldwide, obviously. The, um, you know, how we come back from it is going to be insignificant because, as Lynn has mentioned, we, you know, this is a state that's dependent on educational and medical institutions, eds and meds. Um, the the um, at the state level, their revenues are collapsing. The capital gains are falling. Income tax will fall due to the you know, nearly twenty percent unemployment. Uh, gaming and um, sales taxes drop is dropped off because the only purchases are being done on pretty much online. Sales taxes are falling. Uh, gaming uh, gaming lotteries. Um, the Local option meals tax and lodging taxes, which we benefit from, are pretty much non-existent at this point. Um, and then the thing that's been significant is that while the state has received some federal aid, it's not a, not allowed to be used to backfill any lost revenues for the current fiscal mm -hmm. year. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so on this. Um, 
So the FY21 legislative process has been delayed. They don't know when, how they're going to make a decision. They don't know when they're going to make a decision. Uh, they have received testimony at the state level where at the hearing last week that many people were on that there'd be about a 14.1% decline in revenue based on uh, research done by about a four or five different research organizations, which is about a $4.5 billion hit on a $31 billion budget. Um, and that will be, that will necessitate the state to cut its budgets. Um, local aid is a, is a giant portion um, of the state's budgets. Um, the the legis again, they don't know how to meet the legislature. Um, they don't have a process for meeting remotely like we have now. Uh, the good news is that the state does have $3.5 billion in the rainy day fund, um, but that will only be a part of the answer. And I think they'll be looking at it the same way we do, which is you don't want to use all that up right up, up front. Uh, you need to expect this to last for several years. And so you want to use your savings um, in, in a very uh, cautious way. Um, and then there's some, there's federal money coming in from the, uh, there, to the state from the CARES Act. And uh, the disturbing thing on that has been that, um, you know, the, at the state level, the Senate uh, majority leader in this, in the, at the federal level has said that he doesn't believe there should be money going to states or localities, especially if they're in danger of, of declaring bankruptcy, they should because they've uh, taken on uh, over, they've overcommitted their resources by giving out lucrative pensions and things like that. Well, so next slide. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned this morning, there's several people who've been part of this and remember 10 years ago when we had a similar, um, but in a way a lot easier problem when there was the, the great recession because there was a, just a, a, a momentary collapse of revenues, but we were able to sort of dig out from out under that. Back then, uh, state revenues dropped by 10%. Um, in response, the state cut unrestricted government assistance uh, to the to local, local cities and towns. Education aid was held somewhat harmless because federal money from the ARRA um, money came into the into, into the state. Um, they introduced new local option meals and lodging taxes, which helped to offset some of the, co the, the, um, the cuts in local aid. That money is not there for us because those, those industries have, have stopped supporting, provide, throwing off any revenue to cities and towns. Um, so uh, there is, and again, this is at the federal level, there is a call for additional local aid and I think there's, that'll be a, a pretty large battle at the federal level between the House and the Senate. You go to the next slide. So I, I think actually I'll stop there to see if there are any questions about that piece before we start talking about the calendar piece. See if anybody. Dorothy, uh, was your hand, you never took oh, your no, hand down. No, I took it down. down. I, I, you're right, thank you, let me do that. So there's, um, I don't see anyone's hand up then. Okay, okay. I'll keep rolling then. Um, so again, we're looking at a calendar that has a one month calendar, an FY21 calendar for the remainder of FY21. We have this regional school budget, which, which we have to deal, and then the capital improvement program. So next slide. So this is what, uh, when we were young and innocent, uh, we thought this was going to be our budget schedule and we were right on schedule, maybe a little ahead of schedule. Um, we had things locked in. It was going to be a great budget year. We were going to, we had a bias for action. There was going to be good stuff that we were going to be able to present. People had initiatives that they wanted to present. Um, that's all gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, and um, so we're basically starting over. And, you know, initially that was really demoralizing to a lot of us because so much work, especially at Sonia's level and, and you know, um, at school department and library had done so much work to get their budgets prepared and they were, they were there. And now it's like everything has changed and I, but we're back up. We're ready to take this on this new challenge on and it's kind of, it's actually kind of exciting and something different. I'll say exciting. So it's not agreeing with exciting, but yeah. <laughs> so you go to the next slide. So this is the proposed budget um, process and this is where the finance committee will come in 
and have to make a recommendation to the full town council. So this starts on April 23rd, which is today. Uh, the budget coordinating group met this morning and then the finance committee, which is the second, the second row is meeting right now. Um, we will be asking the finance committee to extend the um, deadlines for the school and library to submit their budgets and also to extend the deadlines for the town manager to submit its, his budgets on the operating capital budgets to the council. The council, we hope, will consider those on Monday, April 27th, and then that, um, then that can be put into effect. Right now, under the current action by the council, uh, the uh, library and the um, schools are submit, supposed to submit their budgets a week from tomorrow. That's not going to happen. Um, on Monday, May 11th, um, at 6.30 p.m., uh, Sonia and I will make a, a presentation uh, and possibly our new finance director, if he's available, um, will participate in that as well. Um, on the FY20 revenues and expenditures and the FY21 revenues and expenditures, that's where we'll be talking about numbers. This presentation to BCG and to Finance Committee, we're not talking about real numbers. Uh, on May 11th, we'll talk about real numbers and what the actual impact is. Um, I, I sort of have categorized the different scenarios that we're building as bad, worse, and worst, uh, with bad being the best, because that is um, where we are. We don't have any good looking scenarios to present to anybody. And we probably won't. Um, so after we make that presentation on Monday night, the Finance Committee, uh, I think Andy has, will call a meeting of the Finance Committee on May 12th. Uh, in which we, the Finance Committee will talk in more detail about the numbers that we presented on Monday night. Um, in, this, in this calendar that uh, Andy really put together, um, he has color-coded these things as, as uh, black is the operating budget, red is the regional school budget, and blue is the um, library schools, the one month budget basically. So we did not put dates in for the regional budgets because um, that's a whole different conversation. And after the meeting, the BCG meeting this morning, Andy and I had a conversation with Mike Morris to dig a little deeper into that. And Andy can, will update that. If, I'll run through this entire budget, then we can come back and talk about it a little bit, um, this entire schedule. Um, so June 1st is when we're asking the council to approve the submission of budgets by the school and the library to the manager. And it's where the J we would ask JCPC to make a recommendation on probably a very bare bones capital plan to the manager. Um, I would submit a one month budget to the council, which would auto get automatic referral to the, to the finance committee. And then the finance committee would have until June 22nd to make a referral, make a recommendation to the full council. Um, I would try to get my budget ready by June 29th um, and the capital plan to the, to the council. Um, June 29th would wouldn't be when the council would approve the one month budget. And then we would have until the end of July just for the council to approve the rest of the FY21 budget. And so that's our race through that calendar because most of you have seen it once, but Andy, is there anything that I went over too quickly? No, uh, not at all. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, basically what I wanted to explain to the committee was that at our last committee meeting, you asked me to give thought to the budget process for FY21, and uh, I did so, and that's what resulted in these two pages of chart that you see. Uh, it was uh, not an easy process and took a lot of uh, uh, coordinated effort um, working with both Lynn and Paul and, and as well as Sonia to make sure that it was a realistic proposal as it was being developed and then it ended up being presented to two different um, uh, meetings today, the, B the BCG meeting this morning and then now. Um, what there, there are a couple of things that I wanted to note about it. When you look at that original schedule, and I'm not suggesting we go back to it because we're all familiar with it, um, it was the traditional schedule that was built into the uh, charter um, and fairly well tracks what we've been used to with some modifications 
because of the change to in form of government. Um, what uh, um, is different from 2008, 2009, which was uh, the period of the uh, so-called Great Recession that Paul is referring to, is that um, if uh, you recall, um, the recession really hit in the fall of 2008. And uh, we went through a long period of time of uncertainty because of the recession. But uh, the budget process could run fairly much along the schedule that it um, traditionally followed for cities and towns. This year was different because the crisis that provoked it didn't happen in the same part of the year as happened in 2008, um, as you know. And as a consequence, we have to really redo the schedule in a whole different way. Um, Fortunately, there's a couple of things. One is the legislature's been understanding of that. And the second is because uh, we are now a city, we no longer operate under the same rules. And uh, we operate under budget provisions in chapter 44 of Massachusetts General Law Section 32, which uh, provides that um, cities can do one month budgets if there's cause to do so. Um, and uh, that, and, and after talking with Paul and Sonia about it, um, it seemed unrealistic to construct a schedule that would get us to a 12 month budget on the usual time frame. And that the wiser thing to propose, um, which is uh, something that we haven't discussed as a finance committee, is to have a one month budget for. Uh, July and uh, then have the annual budget be adopted a month later. And that's why we have really sort of these layered processes of uh, the one month budget and the uh, annual budget. And then of course the regional school budget, which is always under a slightly different time frame anyway. Um, and that's uh, where the um, the, the context of these changes are. So um, what I'm really looking for, because this is a major agenda item for today, is the um, comments that you may have about the budget schedule and questions you may have about the budget schedule. So with that, I'll turn to the two people who've raised hands uh, and asked to be recognized with questions, uh, Kathy and then Dorothy. Kathy? Okay, I have a, a, a question or comment, a couple different ones. Um, when we were speaking about agendas uh, for upcoming uh, council meetings, so Lynn will know the schedule, we, I think we decided we would have a day, and my memory is May 1st, to talk about the enterprise fund separately. We had rescheduled that from March. So I just thought it might be something that the finance committee members would want to have on their calendar as a whole. So it's it's um, just checking on that date in the middle of all of that as a separate discussion. Then I raised- me, Kathy, I want to correct something. It's a discussion with consultants. It's not the actual meeting to set sewer and water rates. Right. Yeah, I didn't mean rates. I meant more uh, like what's the picture look like and what we can do or what. I just didn't know whether people should might want to have that date on their calendar. So it right. wasn't it wasn't a decision making. And piece. it's May 1st at 10 o'clock. OK. Right. And I just like to add on. It's about talking about block rates in particular. So it's really talking about how we set rates, not about rates for FY21. OK. And then the second thing, I, I raised it earlier um, today at the BCG meeting, but um, we, we have a policy goal rather than fixed in stone of 10% um, 
of our general revenues of our property tax for capital. And I didn't know whether we needed to officially change that and whether that would be a recommendation from Paul to be more of a bottom up, what do we have to spend on capital like paying of debt service that it's no longer set as a percentage. It would be more derivative in my mind that we would see what our operating budget looks like and what can we spend on capital. So this would be a year where we're relaxing a goal. And it was set as a guideline um, when we first came in. So just some point at which we actually visit that. And my last comment was on scheduling. Um, you've got it on the next slide. CPAC, I know, has been put on hold for uh, bringing their recommendations for spending. My, my thinking is that they've got money um, in terms of their share of the surcharge that was dedicated to them. So at some point we have to schedule a meeting with them, which I assume is first a meeting where they have a meeting <laughs> with you, Paul and Sonia to try to figure out. And so I would have questions about um, some of the things that they committed to last year that haven't been spent that are might be triggered in FY21, like the $500,000 for 132 Northampton Road, that would be our share if this moves forward. So I just don't know when there, there usually was a, a time scheduled on the finance committee's budget where CPAC would come in. So I don't know what the sequencing of that is. It's, it's a question rather than a have an idea of what to do. So uh, taking the last two questions in order that you presented them, I'm going to say a little bit on the capital and then turn it over to Paul or Sonia if they want to say more and then ask uh, Sonia uh, to pick up on the CPAC question immediately so that it doesn't have to come back to me. And I did see some other hands up, so I'm recognizing who does want to be recognized. Uh, when we established as um, the current town financial policies, um, it was a process that uh, I was in, involved in, so I'm very aware of it. 10% was a goal. We've never achieved the 10% goal. This was the year we were going to achieve the 10% goal. And sadly, um, something got in our way and we're not going to achieve the 10% goal uh, again this year. Um, it was less than 5% uh, when we started the process and uh, we recognized the importance of capital and the consequences of underinvestment in capital. And that's how that 10% um, goal was established. Uh, I have been assuming all along that uh, as has happened every other year in the meeting that happens in the fall, that the um, town manager um, always uh, put forward a budget plan uh, that came with the original projections. And that included the question of the amount per capital and uh, that um, we would hear more about that on May 11. Uh, and then uh, take it up as a finance committee as we take up everything that comes out of those projection meetings in the fall it has to be taken up after May 11th in the same fashion. So Paul, do you have anything to add to that before we go on to the CPAC? No, I don't think so. I think that's pretty much captures it. And uh, the uh, anything else on that, Kathy? Or can we? Go, if I don't, if you don't unmute, we'll no, go on. No, that that's fine. Um, that 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 is what I assumed would happen. But it's and I also thought of it's it's a goal. It's not set in stone. But this year, particularly, it feels derivative rather than trying to set aside a piece of money. We see what we can set aside. <laughs> yeah, I. And I'm, in a, I'm leaving it to Paul to uh, make the determination of what he recommends, and then we'll uh, act off of his recommendation. Uh, Sonia, uh, the CPAC question. Um, 
CPA funds is um, based on estimates, just like the operating budget is. So we start off with an estimated year end balance for June 30 of 2020. And then we add uh, an estimate of what we're going to collect for surcharge and then what we think the state's going to put in. Um, they'll tell us a percentage, and that's what we use for um, estimate. So that's going to change. I don't know what this year is going to end. It's probably going to be the same for this fiscal year. Um, it might be less depending on whether people are paying their tax bills on time by June 30th. That might, some of, we'll collect it, but we might not collect it until until the next fiscal year. Um, the state, I don't feel comfortable with the number in there for state right now. So I would, I would probably eliminate that. But um, when I was looking at the proposals that were recommended by CPAC, there was a pretty good chunk of money that was going to be budgeted as a reserve. So I really don't think they need to change anything. Um, I think once we take out the state and everything, there might still be money for reserve in there. So I think that we might be all set to move forward after one more meeting, just to explain where we're at with it and reduce the amount that's going into budgeted reserve. But that was just me looking at it quickly yesterday, so. But I do think that we need to settle on where we are as a town in terms of our entire financial picture before we start moving forward on some of these other revenue streams because we need to really understand how conservative we need to be going forward um, before we, you know, these are both important revenue streams and there's most of them, there are, there's no urgency to act on them. Right. You can act there when you no want to. There is no urgency to act on CPAC. We could do that a couple months down the road. Dorothy, and then I see Sharon will come after Dorothy. So um, sometimes I don't remember where money comes from. So when it comes to the Kendrick Park Playground, the town has uh, voted a sum of money. Isn't that from CPAC? It's borrowing authorization. So borrowing, okay. Because authorized to borrow, the debt service wouldn't come into play for a year or two. Okay, all right. Because we know that that has that June 1st deadline. Yeah. So right. my, my question was on capital. My memory is that we have two kinds of capital. We have the four capital projects, which we're going to have to talk about. And then we have like, capital that's involved with running the town like uh fixing things repairing things uh new vehicles and whatever and i guess i wanted to have some idea of where we were on the capital that's tied in with running the town as opposed to the four projects how that gets affected well our capital plan basically consists of debt service mm -hmm. Um, previous authorizations. And then, um, so we take 10% of the tax levy, we pay our debt service from there and whatever is left is what we consider cash capital that gets um, allocated out to the schools, the library, the town, other departments. For, for the normal things that we give them every year, not to yeah, do with yeah. anything new, okay? Yes. Okay. But, but Dorothy, just to add on to what Sonia, if we can't give 10%, then once you take debt, debt service is about 1.4 million. So then it's, then it's, what can we do? So it's not going to be a return to normal for roads and repairs. It's going to be something after we figure out the operating budget side. Um, so it's not a simple take 10%, put it over here. Um, we're going to be, Paul's got to do it in the context of a whole budget. I thought 10% was for money we'd already borrowed and already committed. That debt service. Debt that, service, yes. Yeah, that wasn't going to be for new stuff. It was going to be for old stuff. We already. Oh, the debt but we don't have, we have, we may not have received all of that money. I guess that's what you're saying. We borrowed money, but we haven't spent all of it. And we pull it down bit by bit. This, this has nothing to do with borrowed money. We borrow that we get an authorization to borrow money to do a project like um, oh, okay. um, roads, a million dollars. That when that project is completely we borrow temporarily for cash flow for those but when that project is completely done then mm -hmm. we go out to a bond and have a permanent bond and then we pay like a mortgage payment for 10 years mm -hmm. on that well okay from i have to admit that's confusing for me but um there was just one line on that schedule um that said capital and i just thought aren't there a lot of things to talk about 
you know, a couple of slides back, you had a schedule and there was just one little line about capital. Yeah, I think what we're saying is that the capital budget at this point in time is gonna be very, <coughs> only the, the absolute things we have to buy right now. Um, okay. And then so we, that's what I wanted to hear about is what I'm saying. We, we can revisit that at any time, you know, with okay. the form of government, you can revisit this anytime during the course of the year. And as we get a better sense of things, we may come back and say, Hey, we think it looks better. We can actually loosen up some money to buy this, whatever it is that we want to buy. Keep dreaming. <laughs> I, uh, we're kidding. Uh, basically what it amounts to is, is that, uh, we set aside 10% capital and the rest for operating budgets essentially and uh, it's, that's sort of a global way of looking at it but uh, then the capital itself gets divided into pieces with the uh, one piece being what it is that we use for uh, paying back the uh, debt that we've already incurred from prior years commitment well that's a legal obligation to do that and then the remainder gets divided up for various, for whatever other purposes we have. Um, and uh, I think that that's, so it's, it's really how, the amount you allocate to capital and um, how you use it are two different questions. The uh, other thing that we have to recognize is that there's gonna be a lot of stress on the operating budgets this year. And that's what puts the pressure on because the capital is tied to a, a fairly inflexible amount and the amount that we're losing is really coming out of other, um, other areas. It's, since it's 10% of taxation, it's a fixed number that's based upon our tax levy, which by two and a half percent doesn't go down. With those things that were talked about to go down are all of the other categories um, that support the budget. And, uh, if we uh, held to 10%, the decrease in um, operating budgets would be even greater. And uh, Sonia can demonstrate that at some point if there's a need to do so. I want to move on. Uh, Sharon, uh, you've been very patient. I see Pat is with us now participating and also wants to be recognized. But uh, Sharon. So I just wanted to briefly go back to something, uh, Paul, you said. Um, so my understanding is that we're not doing a month to month, month budget. We're gonna do a budget for July and then we're gonna work on a budget for the rest of FY21. And you said you're preparing for a bad, a worst, no, a bad, a more bad and a worst. Um, so I just wanna, understand that i mean so you're preparing for like um you know school starting or school not starting and uh the state defaulting is that is that kind of the just wanted to hear a little bit more about what your what those three things are sure. so we're not looking at the state defaulting uh we're looking at either uh level funded state aid reduction of state aid by 10 or 15 percent reduction of state aid by 25%. We're looking at reductions of our, our, our economic um, income from hotel, motel, maybe a 25% reduction, a 50% reduction, a 75% reduction, you know, different strategies. And, and so we want to put those all together and you can sort of mix and match mm -hmm. and how these all fit together. Um, we do, you know, I think the school feels very strongly that they would like to know sooner than later um, if we are, you know, we don't want to go in month to month because every time you extend out a month, it makes it harder to catch up if you're actually making cuts. So mm -hmm. the sooner we can let everybody know, this town and the school department know what their budget is, we're going to be able to know what kind of uh, re response we have to those, to that, whatever the revenue is that we're able to provide to our, to ourselves. So, you know, um, if you, you know, a cut over six months is a lot harder than a cut over 11 months. Um, so. But but isn't the flip side of that also don't I mean, how are you going to account for um, the possibility of, uh, you know, if, if UMass and Amherst College aren't opening in the fall um, and, you know, like the impact of that 
because that's not just those students, that's people working here at those jobs that aren't going to have, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's like the flip side of the state aid. It's the. Right. So when we talk about, we look at those, the revenue that is impacted by that. So suppose we would say 50%, we were going to lose the first six months of the fiscal year revenue from any um, hotel or meals tax. So that would be one assumption. And that says, that says we're going to be back up and running on January one. Maybe that's too liberal a, a, a projection, maybe it should be 75% reduction. Who knows? We're going to look at different scenarios like that and do our best guess as to what, what we think it might happen, what, where it might land. Okay. Does thank make, you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, Pat? Uh, just a quick apology. I fell asleep in the other room reading a book. And <laughs> so, <laughs> apologies. We're jealous. We're jealous. <laughs> I'm having unstable internet connection on my computer. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. I'm... All right. She uh, has her hand up again. Uh, Dorothy, do you have another question? Yes. So um, I guess what I was thinking about, we made decisions to spend money, but that money doesn't come out of the budget because we're borrowing it. But, but when we do like Centennial Water Plant or some of those other things we said we're going to do, most of the time, that money is going to be borrowed. So my question was, do we still go ahead and borrow the way we thought we were going to, or are we going to reconsider some of those things? So the borrowing authorization is there. And what that allows the manager to do to move forward on these projects it doesn't require the manager or anybody for us to move forward on these projects. Um, and we're going to make judgments on each one of those projects, whether it makes sense to move forward with them or not. Sometimes it'll make sense because prices might be are particularly attractive right now yep. and other times it might say we just don't need whatever it is that we decided to purchase and we shouldn't be moving forward on that so it doesn't you don't need to reconsider it because you mm -hmm. it's just so a it. it's not a requirement mm -hmm. okay that's okay. what i was worried about okay so thank you yeah the other one that's there and i've thought about is that uh I don't know where we are with Pomeroy Lane and the land uh, from the golf course, uh, but I sort of assume that that's in that same category. We've authorized to and judgments will be made as appropriate. Looks like Paul's uh, nodding. So in, that, you know. That's true, and that's again a very complicated um, negotiation still going on. So. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's no resolution to that at this point in time. Okay, thank you. I don't see anybody else wants to be recognized. The only other thing I was gonna just point out, uh, and then we need to uh, see if there are any questions about the dates that are being proposed and uh, then and move it along. Uh, and what I, the, the point that I just wanted to make clear is that uh, chapter 44, section 32, um, says very um, clearly it doesn't use the term one twelfth budget. It uses one month budget. And uh, when those are proposed to us, the one year in the in the one month budget, the one month budget doesn't necessarily have to be one twelfth. And the uh, as has been pointed out to me on several occasions, uh, there are expenses that we incur um, in July at the beginning of the fiscal year that uh, may change that figure. And, uh, but it's really about coming up with an amount to authorize, not a budget that's one twelfth of what we anticipate the annual budget to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, are there any, any feelings that the dates that are at least now listed um, to the extent that you've been able to, and if you need to look through them again, we can go back and show and just quickly scroll through that screen one more time so that you get a chance to look at it. Um, if you have any thoughts about the dates that are being proposed, um, I'm 
I don't see any hands up as we go um, after we show the second page for a moment. I see that I see one hand up now. Kathy. Um, I, I think the schedule looks great. Um, and but what I also think is it looks like a lot of work is going on in between each of these meetings. So this the the good, the the bad, the worse, and the worser, or whatever we it's not really good, bad, and ugly like Clint Eastwood. Um this the sooner those kinds of numbers um, with any level of confidence. And I understand why you don't want to put any number out until you get some better sense for state. But the later the state uncertainty goes, the more this becomes a flexible set of schedules because we've got to know something about the state money for you to be able to do your, is it five to 10%, is it 20%, you know, what happens to that chunk of money? And as Sharon said, you know, if UMass and Amherst don't open up or they do open up, that makes a big difference. So some of these things may be right up to into June that we're still getting that information. So it, I think what I heard this morning is this is our best guess of all these dates right now, but some might have to move a bit depending on what we know and how much more certain we can be about things we do or don't know. So if I can respond to that, Andy. So the state is in the same predicament that we are. They don't have any better information than we do. And they're doing the exact same thing we are doing, making the best guess. And they don't want to go out, you know, too far without having, they understand that if the more conservative they get on their revenue, the bigger cuts they have to make. And so if they are being super conservative, they're going to tell us cut more. Um, so I think they're, just the nature of the beast there's three different entities there the senate the house and the administration that are all have that conversation happening about what should our revenues really look like um and that and i think we're not going to know much from the the, the state uh to really inform our decisions and so we're just going to have to make our best guess the, you know obviously the longer we wait the better off we are in terms of getting better information but at some point we need to make some decisions and that's why this calendar is there to help us make some decisions we do feel it's, it's responsible to ask for one additional month for the entire budget but not i don't think i don't anticipate us coming for another month after that i think we're gonna have to make some judgments and just go with that at this point so um and just commenting for a second that i see bob chance is up but i'll just on the regional school side of things uh, there was a reference made to it earlier. Uh, uh, Paul and I talked with Mike Morris earlier today, but sort of at, right at, shortly after the BCG meeting, and um, he doesn't really have an answer to some key questions because the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, is having a meeting with superintendents and regional districts and uh, chairs of the regional school committees from the regional districts next week, I believe he said on Tuesday. And uh, until they have that meeting, which will be another virtual meeting, as I understand it, uh, we um, he won't be able to give us any significant information back, though. Uh, it's uh, his understanding from conversations with people at Desi that they seem to be leaning towards pressing districts to not adopt a budget on July for 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 a full year on July 1st, but to do a 112th budget, which they're now permitted to do by that special one of the pieces of special legislation that was passed by the legislature um, and uh, to give them more districts more time, encouraging the districts to take more time to develop the budget. Um, he has to weigh that against um, his own needs for stability, managing stability within his district. Um, and that's why uh, in the end, the um, dates don't exist for the regional school budget. And we were waiting for him to come forward with proposals and he's not ready because he at least has to get through next week's meeting before he does that. And uh, so we really don't have anything to discuss on the regional schools. It's not anything we can do anything about right now. 
Um, Bob Hegner. Yeah, I, I just wanted to 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 make sure I understood the kind of the what you're going to do, Paul, with the the bad, ugly, and really ugly or whatever um, budgets is I. I assume, or am I, am I assuming correctly that if you have a series of assumptions of X percent cut in state aid or you know whatever, then the budget implications of that will be part of that discussion. You know, in other words, this is where we have to not spend money or go to the rainy day fund or something like that. Correct. Right. So, so we will identify X dollars. Uh, gap between what our revenue is and what our existing budget is and we will say okay we've got to close that gap how do we do that we can't close it with revenues we've already set, established what our revenue streams are in three different scenarios and so how are we going to do that are we and then we look at all the tools we have for um, uh, for reducing our expenditures and it can be you know we are a heavily people dependent organization as is the schools so putting a number out there will have direct impact on everybody's lives. As soon as we put a number out there, people are going to start saying, how does that impact us? So we want to be really careful about putting that out there because that, in, in that same context, we, there are collective bargaining requirements we have um, for a lot of our, our unions, both the school and the town side. So as we start talking about things, we have to make sure that all of our partners, you know, the, the employees and everybody mm -hmm. understands where we are. There are going to be really difficult decisions to be made things are going to people are going to be disappointed we're not going to be able to do things that we want to do and we're not going to be able to do things that we have always done and uh we're all going to have something that we wish we could have done and there's going to be competing interests at, at play in this that's why it's going to be a difficult conversation with the council and with the finance committee because people will have different priorities in terms of like don't cut here cut here there and why are you doing this and not that we obviously will take through, you know, look at through the, the easiest things first, the things that don't make sense to be spending money on at this point in time. But, you know, that's why we are, we don't want to put a number out there until we, because the, the logical question is like, okay, you've got this gap, how are you going to meet it? And that's a logical question for someone to ask. And we're not, we don't want to be just saying, we don't know. Um, we may have some ideas on these are the categories of things that we can, we can, uh, uh, you know, attach to. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think we're just, it's going to be a lot of uncertainty and we're just going to have to, as you say, kind of make some assumptions and move forward. And the key, is, yeah, the key is going to be about being the, 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 the guidance we will need, especially is how conservative does the count want to be? Uh, or are we projecting this to be a multi year uh, event? Uh, how do you want to use our reserves that we have put in what we've put away, which is really smart over the years? Um, and and do we and do or do we want to hold on to them because we still, you know, there's just so many questions to be discussed. Okay. Um, one last one question from Dorothy, and then I want to move on to the next piece that we need to to address. Uh, Dorothy, you have one more question. Yes. Um, in, in listening to this, I'm, I'm thinking that we really need to think, um, using a cliche, outside of the box. There are many things we want to do, many things that we're going to have to put off, but some things cannot be put off, and that is kids and their education. And just in the article I was reading about what is New York City going to do with absolutely no summer programs for the kids, I, I think we have to run, whether we do it remotely or whatever, we have to run educational and activity book clubs, whatever programs um, over the summer, or we're going to children in the town will be lose out forever. Um, you know, like my grandkids aren't going to lose out because we're doing it, but a lot of kids are going to lose so much that they might not catch up. So I just want to throw that in there that I think we have to not just do the things the way we do, but come up with some new stuff a way we haven't done it when it comes to the kids. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, could you put up for a second the tab that's Charter Section 5 uh, that I sent to you earlier today? And then I want to, uh, it's going to be a segue to get back to Paul. 
um, because what you see there is um, two sections of the budget uh, um, section of the charter that set the April 1st and May 1st dates and then uh, section 5.9 immediately below that allows for the town manager to make a request to the town council to make exceptions. Um, and uh, we've already done that once um, and uh, moved the April 1 date to May 1 and the May 1 date to June 1. Um, and uh, the uh, schedule that we just looked at uh, of course changes those dates yet again. And uh, so uh, the question uh, is, uh, are you making, Paul, are you making a request now to the Finance Committee? So the reason we, we have to do it this way is because if you sent it to the council and then it can't get referred back to committee and it'd be better to just let the committee um, act on recommendation if you have a recommendation. All you need to unmute. Your microphone's not on at the moment, though. Uh, I can email some language to Lynn right now. She, she want, but or I can read it to you. Um, you could, uh, if it's fairly simple, you could just go ahead and read it. Um, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, I request that in accordance with Section 5.9 of the Amherst Home Rule Charter, the Town Council modify the deadline established in Charter Section 5.4a for the Amherst School Committee, Regional School Committee, and Library Trustees to submit their proposed adopted budgets for FY21 to the Town Manager to June 1, 2020. Number two, I request that the Town Council modify the deadline established in Charter Section 5.4b for the town manager to submit a proposed budget for FY21 to the town council to June, uh, whatever that date is, I said June 15th and this might be different. Um, and three, I request that in accordance with section 5.9 of the Amherst Home Rule Charter, the town council modify the deadline established in charter section 5.7C to submit a capital inventory and five-year capital improvement program, program to the town council from May 1 to whatever date we put in there. June 22nd? No. Um, June 29th. Submit one month's budget to council on June 1st. Recommend a one month budget to the council um, finance committee then on June 22nd. And submit a manager, submit an FY21 budget to the council, automatic referral to finance and a capital budget uh, for FY21, that's June 29th. And the council uh, reviews and approves a one month budget. And that is, uh, I can't July, 20th. July 20th. Yeah, July 20th. Yes, we approve the budget. So Paul, your question, and we'll get the dates right. Basically, we're extending everything by a month and your budget will come to the council with automatic referral. Uh, the one month will come to the council on June 1st and the 11 month, in other words, the rest of FY21 will come to the council on the 29th, June 29th. Correct. Okay. And of course, um, uh, it would be preferable if we could uh, have the council act before May 1st, since uh, otherwise it puts the two, um, the, the school committee and the library trustees in an odd place of not being able to meet a deadline. And uh, so I would like to um, see if uh, there's any discussion on this or a motion to, um, change the dates as requested by the town manager. I move to accept the dates as proposed by the town manager and as Lynn just read out. Second. 
Okay, so this motion has been made and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion on this? And uh, included in discussion, if there obviously is, if um, we have any comments from the non voting members of the committee, I um, always want to be able to make sure that comments are offered before we get to voting. So I'll look to see if there's anybody who's asking to speak. Okay. Having I, seen I, no one is asking to speak. Well, a, a question. Um, I'm not sure. I've got this calendar in front of me. I'm not sure how the dates is read match that. So I would vote for this motion with a proviso that the dates get checked and matched. Okay. So I don't want to get stuck on the fact that maybe one of them is wrong, that we have to redo it again. Um, the the dates is written in the proposal. The motion was to coincide, uh, to make sure that the dates are as specified in the schedule as presented. Correct. Absolutely. That's good. Uh, so um, we have a motion that's been made and seconded. We do need to do a roll call vote because this is a remote participation meeting and that's a requirement for remote participation. Uh, I'm going to uh, do my best to be alphabetical, but uh, I'm not perfect on, <coughs> on that. Uh, please excuse me, but Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Uh, Jim Gooser? Yes. Uh, see, Dorothy Pam? Yes. Um, and uh, Kathy Shane? Yes. And I am voting yes, so it's five to zero. Um, so I want to go back to the agenda then. And um, see where we're at with that. I have to clear my screen for a second. So we have uh, talked as much as we can about the uh, about items two and three, the revenue uh, categories and the, the budget discussion that led to item four, consideration of any requests from the town manager pursuant to section 5.9. Uh, I was uh, prescient to put that on the agenda. Um, I said we were going to skip the um, part that um, for scheduling next meeting until after public comment. So I want to um, go over to the list and uh, see if anybody, there's three people who are participating. And I'll give just a moment to see if there are any raised hands for people who are participating remotely as uh, in the meeting and would like to uh, be recognized for public comment. Okay, I see no request for public comment, so we can go back then to the agenda. Um, and uh, the questions that we need to determine are next meeting and then the unanticipated items um, and see if there's any any other unanticipated items people may have. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the next meeting needs to fall in line with the um, work that we're seeing ahead of us. And uh, I guess that the question that I have is a very straightforward one. Um, is there any reason that um, we have to meet prior to May 11 when we get the presentation of the uh, revenue projections? The only thing that was brought up is what Kathy mentioned much earlier about whether there's anything that we wanted to talk about with enterprise funds. Because we're gonna have a lot of work to do later in the year. We're kind of throwing ourselves off schedule 
So I'm going to go back to um, looking to see if there's anybody who wants to be recognized on this uh, question. But I would propose that unless somebody has a specific request, and then we can schedule an extra meeting accordingly, that uh, we try and schedule a meeting for the um, the eleventh is a Tuesday for the following day. Going Andy, back I just to want to correct you. It's the twelfth. Um, the eleventh is the council meeting. It's the twelfth that you have written for finance. I just double yeah, checked. Yeah, that's okay. the day we would have the finance. I'm sorry, May eleventh is the date for the presentation, and then May twelfth would be the date for the next finance committee meeting, unless there's a specific request um, to have a meeting earlier. We would not meet again until May 12th. So I've seen nothing now. If anybody has any other reason that they would like to meet, uh, then uh, we certainly can always um, do so. But um, I, I think we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us after we get the uh, revenue projections and recommendations from the town manager uh, and uh, we might as well preserve our, our time and strengthen our staff time until then and uh, not tie Sonia up and doing anything for else. The only other thing that's coming up and I just want to mention is that um, Sonia will have at some point a um, third quarter budget report and she's already given us a little bit of a preview of the budget report. Um, I would suggest my suggestion would be to have her send the third quarter budget report to the finance committee at a point when she feels that she's ready to do so. Uh, but we not schedule a meeting necessarily just for that purpose. Kathy, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I have a a, a comment and knowing how competent Sonia is. She's probably doing this already, but at one point last year, we were began a discussion of appropriated but not spent funds. Some of it was capital you know, when we came up and bought the school bus. So I'm just going to assume that we're scrubbing budgets by looking at where there are pockets of money, where it may be that there is a plan to spend it, but where they're not spent out and they're not going to spend it all. I know CPAC is doing that with some outstanding grants, trying to figure out whether they can just close them, that they're actually finished. But to the extent we can be freeing up funds because um, people have just been holding on to them, this might be the year to do it. So it's just a, it's a comment rather than a um, question because I'm, I'm assuming that's one of the internal things that's going on. Okay. I'm looking to see if uh, either Sonia or Paul have any comments. If not, then we'll just go on to the last item on the agenda because uh, we've scheduled the next meeting. And uh, so for the last item, I think what I need to get up uh, is I sent a set of minutes to uh, you, Lynn, that had um, something highlighted in green on the 10th page. Um, and while these are marked draft, and what, as you're looking for the 10th page in this, the green section on the 10th page, what this is about um, had to do with the appointment of the three members last year who are the non-voting members. As you recall, it happened in the summertime and uh, there, were, there was an appointment to some staggering of terms with one term, uh, uh, Mary Lou's term to expire um, earlier than the other terms um, were expiring because it just happened that that was what was recommended by the committee that uh, at that point was in the position to review um, appointments to the finance committee. That uh, appointment is now a, pro a power, uh, recommendation has been changed from um, the OCA 
committee, which is uh, being phased out to the GOL committee, governance, uh, outreach and legislation. And they met yesterday. If you look at the green section, um, there was a provision in there that the council is going to evaluate the finance committee process. Um, you can read it for yourself. And uh, that um, was to happen before they uh, engaged in the process, uh, or before the council appointed uh, for the next term. So the committee wants to go forward and um, advertise to the community that there is a position on the committee that will be up for reappointment. Um, they've emphasized that Mary Lou um, certainly is eligible to um, apply for reappointment to that position. Um, and uh, they're just beginning the process, but they wanted to go ahead and have that evaluation done earlier and recommended to the, and have a recommendation that um, gets input from the finance committee and uh, then goes to the um, uh, GOL committee and from GOL to the council and get that done at, an early, is, at the earliest possible date. Um, so I don't have too much to say about that. I don't know that we're prepared to talk about that today. On the other hand, I feel like we're gonna um, get into the discussion at a, at a later date, it'll be harder. Pat, if you're still on the call, you were at the meeting yesterday. Uh, do you have anything to add to what I just said? Uh, no, I think that's uh, um, a very good interpretation. And I just wanted to encourage Mary Lou to think about um, reapplying. So um, we will um, need to have a presentation. I, I mean, I can give my judgment about it right now uh, because I, uh, uh, but um, we will have to get there. So Kathy and then Dorothy. Um, okay, I, I mean, I would be prepared to say this is working extremely well, you know, in terms of when we would have that discussion. And I, if we're not meeting again till May 12th, um, I don't see how we meet on May 12th, make a recommendation that GOL then decides to post or not post the position. It seems like if, if it's the term is expiring at the end of June, doing something sooner than later. So it's a question about timing only, Andy, that if if we think it's working well, are we telling the council that? Are we telling GOL that? Um, and then how do we proceed? Because May, if we don't meet till May 12th, then it would go to the council on May 18th. You know, I, I'm just looking at the, the, the times we're meeting um, and posting, posting an opening presumably is contingent on us thinking this is working fine or not. <laughs> uh, let me hear from Dorothy and then I want to go back to Pat and see what, how you want to respond to that is because you're on the committee, TOL committee too. Dorothy, you have to unmute. Dorothy, we're not hearing you. Okay, I, I think it's okay. Okay, I, I'm very confused by this. I, first of all, the idea that a committee that from the outside would ask, would evaluate us without asking us how it's working and asking the members how it's working seems strange to me. I didn't see the full report. I only saw the half of the sentence that said blah, 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 and not added dissenting opinion. So I don't even know what the problem is or why they're doing it. Um, I would think that if you want to know how it's working, that you would ask the finance committee or ask the finance chair who should talk to the uh, non-voting members and ask them what they think and then separately talk to the finance committee members. So I'm just totally confused by this. And um, maybe Pat can clarify. I think, I, let me take a crack at it first and then, um, we'll get the minutes back up maybe to 
so you can read it again. That was the motion that was passed at the by the council when it did the appointments. It said, yes, let's go forward with the appointments, but before we do it again, let's just try and do an evaluation process. And uh, the other thing to get back to it is, is sort of to tie it in the circle is that I think GOL wanted the first take on getting comments to be from us um, as a finance committee. Do we think it's working? And do we recommend that um, the process continue? You have to remember that the charter says that um, the council may appoint um, non-voting resident members. It doesn't say it will appoint. And so uh, the uh, motion was essentially saying, uh, we should see how it works uh, because no, no other committee has members on it who are not council members. No other standing committee is in that, um, has that and therefore uh, we ought to take a look at it. And um, so it was, and I think GOL is correct in wanting to start with the finance committee offering comments to GOL and then GOL taking it to the council, getting a council uh, decision saying, yes, let's go forward and continue this because it's working well, if that's what the determination is. Um, and take it from there. Pat? Andy, I, Andy, Andy, it's Lynn. I can't raise my hand and also do slides. So I have to do this. Okay. okay. Um, Lynn, add, something? Uh, to all of you, I think um, this, this is the way it occurred. It came up yesterday at GOL and they immediately said, finance committee, would you please evaluate this and come back to us? And at that point, several finance committee, in fact, there are three of us at myself and Andy, were at that meeting. And we all proceeded to say, we thought it was working very well, but we would take it to the committee. And that's why it appeared in the under 48 hour block because it wasn't able to be posted. So I just want to reiterate, having said that, I feel it has worked very well. I personally have appreciated the wisdom of the addition of the people who have been on the finance committee before and the perspective of somebody who comes to this totally from the private sector in a very new way. So that's where I am. So has anyone going has anyone spoken to the members, because I guess I had thought they were going to play a more active role. And I sometimes suspect that they feel that maybe they're not supposed to say very much because I've often feel that they could add, give us additional information that would be very useful and interesting. So I think it's, I'm just wondering if the role is that clear to the non-voting members. I, Mary Lou, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I, uh, in response to Dorothy, I think it was a first year for the three of us also in knowing just how much we were involved or how much we should say. And, you know, it was new for you to have three of us too. So I think over time that, that would change. I think we probably mm -hmm. would have more to comment on. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think it was very new for all of us. Okay. And I, I do think that, um, what we had to say, you listened to, you respected, yep. um, our input. So I feel very positive about it. So I, I hope you would continue having <clears throat> non-voting members. I, I've told people the nice part about non-voting is that you, you don't have to defend your vote. <laughs> And that probably sounds strange, but really, I, I know we make some difficult decisions. And so I can go away feeling, well, I've given you my input. If you want to use it, you can, or you don't have to. So mm -hmm. that's where I stand. 
And I have to say, for my own perspective, the nice of the day is to hear from Sharon. Uh, all three of you have raised very good questions many times through our processes, and some of them are questions that the rest of us didn't think to ask. And but we learned from both of your questions and the answers to them. And that was another that has been another benefit of because I think that all of you are really working hard to think about what we are doing and what we need to do and bringing that outside perspective into the council process. Sharon. So it seems to me that the um, the process is the voting members need to kind of analyze whether this is working for them. So the five of you need to um, determine that. And then as you know, a separate thing, if you want to ask the three non-voting members, if, if we feel like it's valuable, I guess that's a separate question and I'm uh, I'm happy to answer that too. Um, in terms of, I think Pam, you asked, um, it doesn't seem like perhaps we talk very much. I think probably I've talked the least and I generally uh, kind of reserve my comments in meetings to if, if, I, if I think something is unclear or if I um, think something is not in line with how I'm viewing it. Um, I'm not generally one to just take up time in a meeting um, reiterating something else. Um, so those are my those are my thoughts. Thank you, uh, Bob. Yeah, I want to echo <clears throat> what uh, Sharon just said too, and, and and maybe add a little bit that you know, as someone who is coming in with no experience in the town. This has been a very steep learning curve. There's a lot of uh, elements to the town finances that are not obvious um, until you have time to, you know, get involved and, and, and see what's going on and listen to the conversations. So for me, it's been very valuable for me to you know, learn more about how things are working. Or how things do work. <clears throat> I hope I've been helpful in to to the, the, the five council members um, in asking questions and in you know kind of bringing the perspective that I have to the table. So uh, I, I agree with uh, Sharon that you know <clears throat> I'd be happy to answer questions or have a conversation with you all uh, if that's what you would prefer. <clears throat> So we need to think through very quickly the process. Um, Kathy raised an issue um, earlier in this discussion that probably is the right one. If we had given been given a little bit more notice, I think that what we would probably do is want to have some sort of way to hear from the three of you who are um, in the position of being non-voting members about whether you think that it has been useful for you and to get um, in, in positive experience. And uh, if, even if it goes forward, we might could learn from you about what we might do better. Um, and uh, as far as the hearing from the other, from the five of us who are um, counselors, um, our perspective on it. Uh, but to do that, we need time and we're getting into what's going to, looks like it's going to be the really hectic season. Um, so we're kind of caught in a calendar that uh, I don't think was anticipated way back at the beginning uh, when this was first voted and that green language was included. Uh, so it um, does, uh, is there any um, feeling that uh, Anybody would be opposed to uh, Kathy and I trying to together as chair and vice chair 
write something up for GOL and then circulate it to the committee before the next meeting? Would that be an acceptable? Uh, Lynn? My only question is, do you want to vote from the finance committee now? That was the, that was why my hand was up, Andy. Where we just could take a vote. Mine was up say, for the same reason. <laughs> and and you could just then make your recommendation that we as a committee right. think this is working well and we want to keep it. Okay. Um, Pat. I'm echoing Kathy and uh, Lynn. I think that we can vote now. Um, on this and make the recommendation to GOL to go forward. Dorothy? Yes, Dorothy. You need to unmute, Dorothy. Sorry. Okay. I'm, I want to echo them and Andy, what he said something at the very beginning, that it's there's a very steep learning curve. So I think quick, you know, rapid changeover doesn't really have much benefit uh, because it, it takes, as we've said, it takes at least a year to get up to speed. Um, so I would, I, I don't know if we want all these overlapping uh, terms, but I would strongly recommend that we, uh, Mary Lou be reappointed because otherwise, you know, it's just kind of a waste. So, but yes, I would, I would vote to, uh, I agree that we're ready to vote in favor of the non-voting members. Yeah, um, I think that we are not being asked to comment on the uh, who. Um, at this stage, we're being asked to just comment on whether we think that um, this has gone well and we would like to see it continue. Uh, and. Uh, then in another round, um, as happened last year, they'll ask if there's anything we want to change about what we see as being the criteria to consider in the next appointment round, and then go forward um, with yeah. the, it allowed that committee to go forward with to do its work. For Andy, the Lynn has her hand up too. Uh, that's fine. Go ahead, Andy. Sorry. No, go ahead. I'm finished. So I'd like to make a motion that from the perspective of the finance committee members, we have evaluated and continue to see the value of having non non voting residents on the finance committee. Second. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Any, any further discussion from any members, all members of the committee, any requests? If not, then- uh, I don't want it as part of the motion that we have a conversation with non-residents to see if there are ways they might make additional contributions to the discussion and the deliberation of the committee, but that's not part of the motion. In the way it doesn't have to be because that's not what we were asked to do by the uh, so you're, you're saying that term limits does not belong in this discussion. Correct. Okay. All right. Right. So it's, it was it's simply limited to what was in the motion from the council meeting that's on your screen. Just the green section. The yellow section is, serves a different purpose. So I think we all know what it is, and I think we can go ahead and vote. Um, so um, do it again by roll call is required because we're meeting remotely Pet D'Angelis. Um, yes. Um, Dorothy uh, Lynn Griesmer. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. And I vote yes. So it is a unanimous vote. So I think that takes care of um, what we have in the way of activities. We have um, totally gone through the agenda. As of right now, we will not again meet until May 12th after we've received the council has received um, the re report on 
projections for revenue for 12th and any other recommendations that may come from the town manager. Um, I encourage um, the public at large, but I encourage, and I encourage um, the members of this committee who are not um, council members uh, to attend the meeting, which I presume uh, into May at the beginning of, uh, we're we may still be doing remotely, but I have no idea whether that's going to be a remote or an in-person meeting at this point. And unless Lynn has something to say on that subject, we'll just leave it as an unknown. I think there's two meetings you're encouraging people if they want is to come to the May 1st meeting at 10, which is about water and sewer rates, uh, but not setting those rates. Uh, we do have a council meeting this Monday night, uh, the 27th at 6.30. We have a council meeting on the 4th at 7, at, I'm sorry, 6.30. And then the one that I believe Andy is encouraging people to attend is the one on May 11th, which is at 6.30. And that will be much like the meeting that we had back in the fall when all three committees were together and we looked at some financial forecasting. The thing that will be different is the numbers. And as far as I'm aware, the only reason that this committee is, uh, other issue this committee has to deal with is if we hear anything from the regional school discussion that precipitates the need to have a discussion of the committee. Otherwise, I think that we're pretty well set, but I think that's uh, very helpful uh, to know what those meetings are, to remember that there is the one about um, how rates are set for enterprise funds and uh, as noted that's on May 1st at 10 o'clock I assume that that's going to be a remote meeting but we don't know but keep your eye out the time and date have been set and uh, May 11th is uh, the big meeting for the financial projections um, and I don't know if there'll be much of finance on but there's always something I think there's a big stack of things for the May 4th agenda as it is so um, anything else from the committee? Otherwise, I think we can adjourn. I just want to say a big thanks to Sonia and the team that I know is working with Paul, working behind the scenes with much what must be very difficult. So thank you very much. So with that, I will uh, declare the meeting adjourned at 445. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to um, also thank Angela for uh, being with us and um, saying, taking care of our minutes. So thank you and uh, we'll see you all soon.